Okay, hi everyone. So we're very happy today. We have a, a special undergraduate colloquium um, by Zach Murray from Dalhousie University of Canada, who is going to tell us about constructive real numbers in the AGDA proof assistant. Zach, please. Hey, thanks for having me. It's uh, nice to be here. And yeah, I guess I'll just get started. So yeah, I'll first, oops, didn't want to click. Here we go. So I'll first just say a little bit about uh, constructivism. So for anybody who doesn't know much about it. So constructivism kind of started, not technically started with, but this is what early constructivism is identified with is with the Dutch topologist Brouwer's intuitionism. Uh, it was based on his mathematical and like Kantian philosophy that mathematical objects are constructed by the mind prior to outer experience. Um, so as you can tell, it's really reliant on a bunch of philosophical imports in particular, like Kantian uh, pure intuition in order to explain where mathematical objects come from, since they're not assumed to be out there in outer reality. Although the thing is that Brouwer's intuitionism contradicted classical analysis. So when Brouwer started doing uh, uh, mathematics on the real line, he found things like every real function that he built is actually continuous because of uh, philosophical imports that he brought in. So it wasn't considered tenable. And for a long time, constructive analysis in general just wasn't considered tenable for this reason. But modern constructivism is less about the philosophy and more about actual practical mathematics and in our case on a computer. And the slogan is just that for a mathematical object to exist, it has to be constructed. There's no specification uh, exactly of what constructed means at this, you know, from uh, the perspective of just basic constructivism. So different constructive theories will kind of implement a different meaning of constructive, uh, which is what we will kind of talk about later. And in particular, it's important to know that to prove that there exists some X satisfying some predicate, we need a method to find that X and a way to prove that it exists. So this means that we get laws like double negation, that not not P implies P, that's invalid. So we can't assume that is an axiom because we could just prove that there exists an X satisfying a predicate without actually providing a method to construct that X. It also means that laws like excluded middle are also false, uh, not false, but invalid. Uh, because it's equivalent to double negation. And also the axiom of choice is invalid because it implies excluded middle. And also if you think about it, you know, from the from the, the idea that to exist is to be constructed, the axiom of choice doesn't give you a, a method of how to construct a choice function, so it's going to be invalid anyway. So principles like that are going to be invalid. Um, there's a whole class of them. I won't go over all of them, only these ones, but this is kind of the constructivist landscape. And you may already be thinking, how is analysis gonna be possible without choice principles uh, and without certain choice principles and how does that work? So we'll see that in a bit. And in order to use all these laws, you have to prove them to use them. So it's just like I just said, uh, these laws aren't false. It's just that they're not assumed as axioms. And I'll just tell you a bit about uh, constructive logic and the interpretation that the constructive reals I'm using uh, uses of, of logic, which is called the brouwer heiding kolmogorov interpretation. So the idea is to interpret uh, proofs kind of from constructing them from the ground up. So it's going to be P implies Q is just going to be a mapping of proofs of P to proofs of Q. And then P and Q is just a pair of proofs of P and Q. And then P or Q is just either a proof of P or a proof of, a proof of Q along with a tag saying which one it is. Uh, existence is just a, uh, exists an X such that satisfying predicate is just some element A that satisfies the predicate uh, along with a proof of the predicate. And then for all, for all is interesting and special. We'll get to that in a bit. For all is a function that maps objects X to proofs of P of X. And you might know, think that there's, you know, there's no, it might be hard to explain how that looks in regular mathematics. How do you define a function that maps X to P of X like that? So we'll get to that in a second. And then negation is a bit interesting in that it's a proof of P implies uh, a contradiction. Although I won't go over too much into that because it's not important for our purposes. So that's constructive logic. And now we'll talk a bit more about uh, what, what it means to construct a mathematical object. 
So as I said before, constructivism doesn't always come with uh, a definition of what it means to construct a mathematical object or a proof. So we're going to interpret it in a programming language uh, context, and we're also it's also going to give us an idea of what mathematical objects are in this language. So the Curry-Howard correspondence says that, okay, if we go ahead and try to interpret construct and what mathematical objects are from the perspective of a programming language, we're going to take the following. Propositions and sets are going to be types in the language, and then proofs and objects are going to be constructed by functions. So propositions are types and proofs are programs is the, is the slogan here. But as I said before, the for all, uh, for all is a little bit of a weird case because you're thinking, you might be thinking now, like, how would you explain that in Java or Haskell, like in a language like that? You can imagine, you know, a function that takes in and say Java, it takes in an integer X, but you can't use that integer X in the return type of the function. So in order to be able to do that, we need special kind of types, which are called dependent types. And to give you an example from Agda, this is what it looks like. So we've got a function F and it's got a dependent type. Depend, uh, a dependent type is just a type dependent on some object, in this case, X. So this is read as function F has type for all X that you take in from A, uh, taken a proof of P of X, and then it returns a proof of Q of X. And this is actually a function. So this is, it's, uh, it, it is a function. It's a function taking in some X and then proof of PX and then proof, uh, and then it returns a proof of uh, QX. And then, uh, languages that have the, this property of having dependent types are called dependently typed programming languages. And then we usually use dependent types uh, for proof assistance, as we're going to do here. So I'm going to introduce now the proof assistant Agda. I'll just share that one sec. It's just loading. Yep. Is that up? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I just called Agda a proof assistant. So why is it actually a proof assistant? Like, you know, I, you might see why it's called a dependently typed programming language because it has dependent types. But why is it called a proof assistant? And the reason is it's called a proof assistant because it has a bunch of programming language uh, properties to help us prove uh, the different theorems and make define mathematical concepts. So in particular, we can use stuff like automation to automate proofs. And Agda has a nice little mode that we're going to see <clears throat> part of my little development environment here that is going to help us uh, write proofs and help us figure out how to write proofs. So we'll start off with just an example of defining the type of natural numbers, because remember that sets are identified with types. So we'll define it in the piano sense. We've got zero as a natural and successor function. And we'll ignore the additional axioms for now, like induction, and we'll get to that later. So we'll just define natural numbers for now, just with zero and successor of n. So to do that in Agda, we have to define the natural numbers as a data type. And they themselves have type set, because they're a set, where they have the following elements. Zero, and then a recursive constructor successor that takes in a natural and returns a natural. And that's that. That's how you define the naturals in Agda. So nothing too hard to think about yet, uh, or in particular with the naturals at least. So I'll just scroll down and we'll define addition now on uh, the naturals. So usually when we define addition, like using piano, we'll define it recursively, right? So we'll define like add zero n is gonna be n and add successor of m and n will just be the successor of the addition. So we're going to do the same thing in Agda where we define it as a recursive function. But we don't have to, first of all, we don't have to go ahead and define it using this add syntax because Agda is a really nice programming language. We can actually define functions using infix notation just in this little syntax here, like you would in classical mathematics. Um, so it's going to be a function taking in two natural numbers. And it's going to return another natural number. So when I write m plus n, I'm going to click a little button here for defining the function. 
And there are a couple of things. So you'll notice that this green thing has popped up. And this is part of Agda's uh, interactive uh, environment here in my Emacs editor. So this little green thing is called a hole. And we write our code in these holes. And we can evaluate code here. Uh, we can test it. We can, and then we can enforce, get rid of the hole to make that our definition of whatever we're trying to write. So in particular, uh, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen now, there's something called a goal. And that tells us what we need to put in this hole. And in particular, it says we have to put a natural number in the hole. And then underneath is everything we have in the local context, which are two variables. So we have to define this recursively and we're gonna do uh, just a recursive little pattern match here. Um, and there's a nice little button we can click to do a pattern match. We'll do it on M to recursively define on M like we did in before informally. And Agda will just split it into the function into two separate cases and introduce two new holes, both of which are looking for natural numbers. <clears throat> so in the first case, now it's zero plus N. So that's just gonna be N. And when we write N and click another button, that just gets rid of the hole and that part of the function is done. Now as for the second hole, it's gonna be the same story. You can just write successor to M plus N and then the hole disappears and that's the definition. So that's just the recursive definition of naturals in Agda. Nothing, I don't, nothing super surprising, but it is nice to be able to write infix notation. Okay, now on to the first proof. I'm just going to uncomment something that I need. I won't explain that. So let's go ahead and just make a really simple proof. Uh, in particular, we'll just prove that the successor of m is equal to m plus 1 uh, for all natural numbers. Now, I said before we were going to ignore the induction axiom. There's no, we didn't have to assume an induction axiom everywhere. There's no need to assume an induction axiom because when you define a data type, you're just going to use recursion on it anyway to define functions. And as we just did with addition, and as I said before, uh, proofs are just given by functions. So we can just define a function that's recursive on the natural numbers and use that for induction. So I guess I'll just name the proof something like this. Suck it M equals M plus one. And it's gonna have the type where it takes in any natural number. And then it spits out a proof that the successor of that natural number is equal to M plus one. I'll just note something here. Okay, so you might notice, I don't know if it's hard to see on the screen in your room, but that uh, <clears throat> this equal sign has three bars instead of two. And the reason for that is just like in any other programming language where equals corresponds to defining functions and things. And, you know, e and in other languages, the comparison operator is like two equal signs. But in Agda's case, it's just this three bar equal sign. Oh yeah, and I guess I should notice note something that's really, I mean, you've, you've definitely already noticed this at this point, but I'm typing Unicode characters uh, in Agda with little shortcuts, like the naturals is slash B N. Um, not really a thing you can do in most programming environments. So, but it's very useful for math, obviously. So you don't have to type the word for all, for the for all quantifier, uh, which is very nice. So anyway, back to the actual point. Uh, now you'll see in the hole, there's a new goal this time, and it says it's exactly what we're trying to prove. And then we've got in our context just the natural number. So if we're going to do this before, like we did with recursion, we can just do recursion uh, split on M. And now we've got a case where M is zero, and defining the function in that case, and then the case where M is of the form successor of some other number. Now we've got two goals, and there's something special, because in the first one, for the, the case where M is zero, it just says one is equal to one. Now, what we're, we had to prove successor of zero equals zero plus one. And thankfully, Agda is just going to automatically recognize successor of zero as one by definition. And it automatically computes addition in this case to be one equals one. So that's a really nice proof. Uh, we don't have to apply any axioms or anything. And in particular, we can just say it's true by reflexivity. So you can just type REFL, I mean, by reflexivity, and Agda accepts that as a proof. Now, as for the second case, the inductive case, if we're doing this on paper, we say, okay, because successor is a function, uh, we can just prove the two things. Uh, it, its arguments are equal, and therefore we're done. So the way we say that in Agda is just by writing Kong suck to say 
this thing is a function, prove the arguments equal. Then we get a new hole where we just have to prove that the arguments are equal. And that's just, we're just, we can just use recursion to prove that. That's our induction hypothesis. So we call the function again, this time on the smaller argument M and reduce it and Agda accepts it as a proof. And that's the first proof uh, in Agda and the nice ways like with the environment that it helps you do your little proof. You know, the, the environment is nice and we'll get to see some later, some more automation techniques that are a bit nicer and more attractive because you know, the environment can be nice but if there's no automation, why use it? So, I'm just going to comment out some things here before I continue, because it, uh, it it interferes with the rest of my code. So I'll just ignore this for now. I'm just preparing this for later so I don't forget. Okay, now I'll go back to the slides. Okay, here we go. So now we're gonna talk about uh, just what constructive real numbers look like in the setting that I'm using. So the constructive real numbers that I'm using are made by the American analyst, Eric Bishop in the, late, uh, in the mid 20th century. Um, following criticisms of Brower by Hil uh, Hilbert actually, and others like, the, like uh, Bertrand Russell uh, and some other philosophers. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, bit, constructivism was kind of on downturn. Uh, it wasn't seen as particularly important or useful. And the fact that constructive analysis from Brower's perspective made contradictions to classical analysis meant that nobody actually wanted to work with it. Um, so Hilbert made comments like uh, uh, in the tone that in the vein that constructive analysis just can't be done. You can't have analysis without excluded middle or without, ac without axiom of choice. And the American analyst, Eric Bishop, said, no, you actually can. And he wrote an entire textbook detailing the foundations of constructive analysis, as the title goes, which we're going to follow now and see how he defines the real numbers. And it's much more agreeable to classical analysis than uh, Brouwer's. So we'll start off just defining uh, something called a regular sequence instead of defining a Cauchy sequence. So a sequence of rationals is regular. If for non-zero naturals M and N, we have this property. And we're actually going to say that a real number will just be a regular sequence of rational numbers uh, wholesale. Okay, and then we're just going to define equality separately. So two real numbers, X and Y, are going to be equal if for every natural number we have this property. Um, and we're not going to take any quotients here. We're just going to say this is what a real number is, this regular sequence of rationals, and then two real numbers are equal in this case. So there's no quotient over, uh, like, all the equivalent equivalence classes or anything um, for two reasons. One I'll just say is that Bishop thinks it's pointless because you can use this definition and not have to work with the equivalence classes. So why work with them? And the second reason is more interesting and is actually related to the programming language we're using and programming languages, uh, dependently typed programming languages and proof assistance in general, which we'll get into a bit later. So if anybody has any questions about these, they can ask them because I've taught, did this talk before and people did, but if if not, I'll just continue. While I switch to the other screen. Just, just okay. People were concerned before about how that equality is actually an equivalence relation, but maybe people aren't as uh, skeptical uh, considering it's in the proof assistant this time. So, so anyway, um, We'll just give the definition of the reals in Agda now. So a real number uh, in Agda is going to consist of two things. It's going to consist of the sequence of rationals, but it's also going to have a proof that the, it's going to consist actually like as part of what a real number is, the proof of that the sequence is regular. So usually in math, you know, if you have a set like of some sort, set of objects, uh, X satisfying some property, you don't have a, you know, objects in the set don't come with the proof that they satisfy the property. But in constructive mathematics, it's common for them to come with the proof, uh, at least implicitly. So especially in this case, that's what we're going to do. So we'll go ahead and define the, uh, the type of reals. In this case, it's going to be called a record type. Um, 
I won't explain why it's not very interesting. So I'll just do that. Uh, it's a record type. It's going to be constructed with this constructor. Uh, just a constructor in the sense like a constructor in another programming language, like in Java, how you have object constructors. Make our here is just going to be a constructor for real numbers. And a real number is going to consist of the following fields. It's going to consist of the sequence of rationals. And then it's going to consist of a proof that it's regular. So for regularity, we have to take in two natural numbers, M and N. We also have to take in proofs that they're non-zero because our natural numbers start from zero. So I'm going to use these special brackets and I'll explain those in a second, but it's still taking in a proof that both of these natural numbers are non-zero. So PM is a proof that M is non-zero. And then PN is going to be a proof that N is non-zero. And regularity has to return a proof of that of the condition above, which we can write out as follows. Instead of writing X sub M, I have to write seek because that's how I wrote it in the definition. Um, so seek M minus seek N. And then this is less than or equal to this is just the syntax for fractions. It looks a little, I mean, ugly in a way, but there it goes. One over M plus one over N. Okay, so there's a special thing about this definition that's really nice. Um, and it's related to these brackets here. So we had to take in the proof that the natural numbers are non-zero, right? So you might be thinking, well, why didn't we have to tell the fraction when we wrote it that they're non-zero? Because it's a function, right? So like this, this division function must take in a proof that the natural numbers are non-zero. And it actually does, it does take in the proof, but it takes in the proof in a special way using these weird brackets. So these weird brackets uh, are meant to indicate Agda's version of Haskell's type classes. Uh, and in Agda, they're called instance arguments. And basically uh, for people who don't know what type classes are, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to, Agda is going to look in the uh, current programming context to see if it can find a proof of a property indicated by the type class brackets. And anytime it needs it, it's going to automatically and invisibly insert it where it's necessary. So these are in the given context, these two proofs. Uh, and when we write out the fractions for these functions, Agda invisibly puts these proofs in there for us. So we don't need to bother writing out the proof. And in most cases, actually, Agda will synthesize the proof that M is non-zero uh, itself. So in simple cases where you have a natural number of the form successor of some other natural, Agda will know that it's non-zero and it will synthesize this instance argument itself without us having to do it. And it will automatically put it in for us, which is really nice. So for the most part, we don't ever have to worry. Uh, we don't usually have to worry about frac proving that fractions are non-zero. Agda is very smart and automates it for us. So that's a nice feature of automation from the programming languages perspective. Okay. So that's the real numbers. Uh, and now we'll just define what equality looks like on reals. Or do I have to uncommon something else? This is just making the, this open statement is just making the fields of the real numbers accessible to me. So, okay, now we have to define equality. So equality itself is gonna be a type and it's gonna, return, it's gonna take in two real numbers and then output the type of all proofs that those two real numbers are equal. So um, I don't know, maybe people have questions. If anybody knows any Agda, they'll have questions why I define equality as a data type instead of in a different way afterwards, but I'll, I'll, I'll ignore that for now. So quality is gonna be a data type. And again, we're using a different symbol, this time in equals, you know, a, a squiggly line equals uh, to not contradict and get in, to not overrun the three line equals. The three line equals has a bit more of a special definition as inequality. So this is just going to be a real number equality. It, it's, go, uh, it's going to need to take in two real numbers and it outputs the type of all proofs that they're equal. And now, so this type, it's, its elements are going to be the proofs that the two real numbers are equal. So we better define how two real numbers are equal. So we can make a little constructor here that we use. So uh, in order to prove it. So this little constructor here, star equals star, it's like how we had the natural numbers earlier. Zero was a constructor for the natural numbers and successor was as well. 
we could write suck in. In this case, we can write star equals star and then our natural numbers and or and real numbers and you know th uh, this given property here and it will return a proof that the reals are equal. So take in our two natural number uh, sorry one natural number actually we we better take in the real numbers first. <laughs> so take in the real numbers and then take in the non-zero naturals. again, using those special brackets. Then we have to take in a proof of this property up here. And now that I don't, I'm not defining the reals, I can still use the seek syntax, but I have to write seek x m to uh, specify x sub m. And then seek y m, that's gonna be less than or equal to uh, two over m. Okay. So this is the information that all the information that this is going to have to take in. We better give it a return type because it needs to return a proof that the two real numbers are equal. Oops. There we go. So this is just a type constructor for equality, takes in our two real numbers, takes in a proof of the given property, and then outputs a proof that the real numbers are equal. So that's that. Excuse me, mind if I ask a question here? Yep, sure. Um, uh, why not just land in, uh, why, why define the, why wrap it in this data type? Why not just land in the, uh, in the, uh, proposition you have there that generates it? Do you mean like, um, so we just use a different symbol. Do you mean defining it yeah, like just this? Define, just define it as a... Yeah. So there's a special reason for yeah. that, uh, that I encountered. Um, it turns out that if you define it in this way that you just suggested, um, there's a ring solver I'm about to show that mm. has a hard time, and it's not even just the ring solver, it's other functions as well. Um, when you take in proofs of equality, um, it has a hard time synthesizing some of the arguments for the equality definition automatically. And in particular, the way I usually define this, um, is I leave X and Y implicit. So I don't have to put them in explicitly and Agda will synthesize them automatically from this proof of this property. Uh, but it turns out if you use that with this definition, Agda can't synthesize usually these two X and Y. So even if you write like reflexivity, it won't synthesize it, the arguments. Uh, if you've got a, whole, a goal like X equals Y, that's your goal. I guess I rewrote that twice. And you write by reflexivity. Agda won't be able to synthesize the X and Y, and you'll have to specify them, uh, specify them yourself. Thanks. Yep. Well, maybe on that point for the lay, <coughs> lay people among us, could you just say what, what does the data word actually do? I don't even know. What does this wrapping? Yeah. Yeah, so it defines. Uh, sorry? Yeah, please. Okay, yeah. So data is like just data, defining it. A, uh, it's defining like an inductive type. So it's uh, in an in inductive or recursive like construction. So data, when you say data and you list these green constructors, <laughs> those are the, in, it's like an inductive definition of this type. Just like with the natural numbers before, there's no other way to define uh, a type inductively in this way in Agda. So it's just its way of, of doing an inductive data type or recursive type in this case, I guess. So when you write this out, like when you write for the natural numbers, data n is a set where these things are the elements, the data keyword is gonna be the thing that allows you to say, these are the only elements uh, of, this, of, this, of this set. And it's also what allows you to do the pattern matching, the recursive matching uh, that I showed earlier. Because this data stuff is doing a bunch of stuff in the background to say that this is like an inductive definition of the natural numbers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess so. So putting data here around this function says, okay, let's define this function as an inductive type just for that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks. Okay. Is there any, uh, any more questions?
Okay, I'll continue. Uh, I have yeah. another question. Aren't the X and Y bound in the in the heading of the data type? When you get a, yes. are you aren't you getting a new X and Y down here? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I guess I could have put it up here. I just didn't put it up here out of uh, just that's the style I've been doing. So I, I didn't, I don't think, I guess I didn't need to bind it. I just did it for, uh, just because that's the style I'm used to. Okay. Yeah. It does make it look a little weird, I guess. Yeah. So there, yeah, it, it's just, this is saying take in. Yeah, it's just, it's it, it is a weird right syntax. Side, at, at the top, <clears> because it's on the right-hand side of the colon, that's why it's not, they're not, the names aren't bound on the interior. Is that right? Oh yes, that's correct. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. You could leave them. Yeah, it's a weird syntax, and you it feels like it should be bound, but it's not. So, Thanks. yeah. So for that matter, uh, I guess we'll get now on to addition. So I'll ignore that for now. So um, let me get rid of this. And we'll go through it. So to define addition on reals and bishop sense uh, is going to be decently similar to the Cauchy style definition, except for the sequence. So for x plus y. Uh, for that sequence, we're just going to sum every second element. And now we're just going to prove that it's regular. And this is a pretty simple proof, right? So like if you need to prove that it's regular, you need to prove x2m plus y2m minus x2n plus y2n. You know, you just need to show that that's less than or equal to 1 over m plus 1 over n, right? And that's a simple enough proof, but I'll write it out anyway, because we're going to compare this to what it looks like in Agda. Uh, and see some solve, uh, some tools that can help us. So if we're writing this out, the obvious step to take is just rearrange this because what's on the inside. I'm writing it out all specifically to get every step down. So rearrange it, and that's just a trivial ring equality on the inside, right? So that's important to note. Um, then we can just apply triangle inequality. Okay, and then just the proof that since X and Y are each regular, so we can apply that on the argument 2M, we get 2M inverse plus 2N inverse plus the same thing again. And it's just gonna be, it's just gonna be the sum of halves. So it's just gonna be equal to M, N, M inverse plus N inverse. And that's the proof. So it's a simple proof, obviously. Um, but you know, when we write this proof, it's nice to write it in this little equational format with the proof on the, the reason why on the side, it's pretty readable. So there, it better be equally readable in Agda, right? And it actually is. So we'll just get to the definition quick. I've got this written out already because it would take too long to write in Agda otherwise. But let's see. So we'll ignore the proof for now and we'll just focus on the definition. So I'll note a couple of things. Um, sorry, just this is just getting in the way. There we go. So I'm defining addition using a, a different symbol now. So like R plus instead of just plus. You can use the instance arguments in Agda to just write plus. Um, I just didn't want to go through the hassle of setting it up in this case. So plus the plus that I'm actually using is just the rational number plus. Um, and I didn't, I just didn't want to go through the hassle of setting it up so that plus can refer to do two different things uh, just for the sake of the talk. So that's that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's simple enough. Uh, we just define the real number, the, the new real number for X plus Y on its field. So on the sequence field, and then on the regularity field below. So for the sequence, we can just access it as you'd expect. It's not particularly surprising. The regularity, on the other hand, is a bit more interesting. So I've got to, okay, I'm going to note something here. The stuff that appears up here, you can ignore. Um, if anybody has any questions about any particular details of it, ask after I give the proof, um, if you're like in, in, into Agda, um, and I'll explain a couple of the things of it. But the main th goal is just to make the syntax more readable. Uh, so, it, you know, it's easier to read the proof, right? So to look at the proof then, this is what it's gonna look like. I write begin 
and it gives me this nice syntax to write an equational format. So in particular, the way you'll read this is that this thing here we're saying is equal to the next thing for the reason given in this whole. So I'll, I'll say that again because I mix it up a little bit. This thing here is equal to for the reason given in this whole, uh, the thing on the next line. And this thing here is less than or equal to for the reason given in the whole, the thing on the next line, and so on. And Agda automatically applies like transitivity and all the properties that will build this proof into a proof that this thing is less than or equal to one over M plus one over N. So you can see I've already done some part of the proof. So in particular, I've done like the second step we did from before where I applied the triangle inequality here. And I've also applied regularity here. You can see actually uh, one of the things I toss in here says reg X and reg Y just for regularity of X and Y. And the more interesting parts are the other two that are left open. We're only gonna solve one of them and we'll solve, we'll do the first hole because um, the second hole will be similar enough that it doesn't matter. and We don't want to waste the time. So the first hole, remember that this was just a trivial ring equality. So, you know, if we just applied the ring axioms one by one, it would take a long time to prove this, right? Like it'd be annoying. So instead, we're going to use a ring equation solver for rational numbers. And the way that's going to work is it takes polynomials and rationals uh, and converts them into something called Horner normal form. So to give you an example of what that looks like for a quadratic equation of one variable, uh, if you want to prove two quadratics equal, it converts it into two, these two normal forms up here, both sides of the equation. And then it just checks that the coefficients are equal. So any polynomial you give, it'll have some canonical Horner normal form uh, that Agda is going to use the solver to put into. And then it just checks that the, the coefficients are equal. And it does that automatically. So it's going to automatically check if they're equal. Uh, for the most part, we'll have, to, we'll have to supply part of a proof for that. Now, in order to use this solver, we just have to write solve. And, oh, sorry, I forgot one thing. We got to get rid of the absolute value bars. So there's a function to get rid of the absolute value bars and just prove that the stuff on the inside is equal. We've got a new goal. Uh, I won't expand it because it looks kind of ugly. But... To use the solver now, we just write solve. We've got four different objects that we're using here, x2m, y2m, and then the 2n variants. So solve in four different variables. And anybody who's used a different proof system might be wondering why I have to write all this, but I'll get to that later. And we get a bunch of new goals. So I'll explain what each of these is one by one. So the first hole, we have to write an abstract syntax for uh, the equality we're trying to prove. So we're basically just rewriting the same equality. In other proof systems, you don't have to rewrite this same equality. Um, and there are special cases where you can use the Agda ring solver and you don't need to rewrite the equality. Agda just picks it up from reading the goal. Um, the ring solver in Agda uh, is a little bit underpowered in this sense and in, it could be fixed, I think, in an easy, but maybe a little bit of a time consuming way. So I guess nobody's done it for that reason. Um, but we'll have to live with it for now. So we'll just have to use a little bit of an abstract syntax for it. So we just have to rewrite our arguments. And it's not a particularly deep syntax. So we'll just, you know, it's going to look basically the exact same, just with different symbols for plus, minus, and equals. And you'll notice the way I'm developing this, um, I keep splitting into new holes. So like I'll create a new hole now. So like this is the equal sign. So the left-hand side will be this hole and then the right-hand side will be this other hole. Um, the reason I'm doing that is so Agda does automatic bracketing. Uh, you know, sometimes you mix up the bracketing so it's easier to let you, the holes, when you reduce them, if brackets need to be there, Agda will take care of it. And in this case, I usually screw it up. So it's helpful. So the left-hand side. There we go. And the right-hand side, oops, and there we go. So that's our little abstract syntax for the equation. Now the next hole right here, leftmost one. So I said before, Agda is gonna, to an extent, automatically prove that the coefficients are equal. 
So in our case, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to automatically compute them like it did for zero plus one earlier, but it still is expecting a proof that the coefficients are equal. So we'll get coefficients. And in this case, it's going to be of the form like a naught equals a naught. So it's just going to be true by reflexivity. And usually when you use the solver, this is the case, it's extremely rare. Uh, and usually uh, that it's not the case where you can prove this by reflexivity, that the two normal forms are the same. Uh, and if, it, if you can't prove it by reflexivity, usually it means you've messed something up and we'll see a way it could be messed up later. So if we say by reflexivity of equality on the rational numbers. And then the next few arguments here are just the, the uh, variables used in the equation, which is going to be X to M and so on. Agda can automatically infer these if you put them in a certain order, but for those who are Agda experts, but I'm not going to do that right now. Okay, so that's that whole finished. So the ring solver automatically puts these into normal forms, uh, proves that the two forms are equal, and that's a lot easier. You know, as much as this syntax is annoying, it's a lot easier than writing out the ring equalities yourself and using all the ring axioms. Okay, so the second hole for the adding the halves could be done with the ring solver as well. Um, if there was a little bit more infrastructure for the rational numbers, you know, Agda might just automatically compute these anyway. There's not as much, as many automatic tools as I'd like for the rationals in the standard library. Um, so we'd have to use the ring solver again, but I don't want to write out all the abstract syntax again, so let's not bother. Okay, so that is going to end the Agda portion of the talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions about this, uh, feel free to ask now while I still have it up on the screen. Just a trivial question. I, I kept wondering why you have the multiplication of the plus signs, but I guess plus one is just the notation for the positive unit. You keep writing plus plus one for the down, not up on the screen. You scroll down a bit. Oh, this stuff here? Oh, or, or, oh, sorry, you mean like right here with the fractions? Yeah, it's there, yeah. It keeps saying plus, yeah. but it's probably because read plus one is the primitive for positive unit or something. Yeah, exactly. If you write the negative sign, like negative one over two M, it'll just read it as a negative fraction. And the bottom, uh, the denominator solve. always needs to be a natural number. Can we tell actor that just a plain one without a sign means the positive one? Uh, you could set it up to do that, but you can't do it in this case. Like I could do some extra things to set it up, but if I write it, like if I write one over M, it's going to give me an error because it's expecting the top argument to be a, uh, a, a uh, integer. And integers are of the form like plus one or minus one and so on. Yeah, you could, you could make a second division symbol that takes in a natural number or a positive integer for the first argument and do that. Uh, but... I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, I guess you could do that. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter a whole lot. It'd just be a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so I'll switch back to the slides now. Let's see. Okay, so... Now I'll just talk a little bit about some properties of uh, Bishop's real numbers, because you might be wondering why did I implement these ones instead of other real numbers? Like if you know anything about constructive math, why didn't I implement, implement Black Browers? Well, I guess maybe that's obvious because it contradicts classical analysis, but why not like the homotopy type theory of reals or something? So I'll just say Bishop's real satisfy the following properties. They satisfy our committee and property and density and all that basic stuff. They also satisfy uncountability. Um, Interestingly, if you have any ex expertise about real numbers, uh, like about like uh, constructive reals, you'll know that uncountability requires the axiom of countable choice, which is just a variant of the axiom of choice. It turns out that in Bishop's system and in Agda in particular, uh, countable choice is a theorem. You can actually prove it uh, using, and it's it's a really trivial proof basically. Um, if anybody's interested, I'll give it after in Agda, but it's, you know, it's not very interesting basically. So it's actually provable uh, because of our interpretation of logic and what exists means. But the axiom of choice, you know, you might wonder if the axiom of choice is provable. Uh, 
there's a there's an interesting subtlety there. If anybody's interested, I'll I'll they can ask about it afterwards, and I can explain why it's not provable. But yeah, so accountability holds, and Cauchy completeness also holds. Uh, so, you know, um, all Cauchy sequences converge to a real number, and they're also equivalent to Dedekind cuts, which also requires uh, the axiom of countable choice. But there's a bunch of results from classical analysis that are just too strong to prove, like the least upper bound property. So the reals aren't complete in the sense that the least upper bound property holds. Uh, it doesn't hold, it's just not provable. It's not false, but it's not provable. And then the intermediate value theorem is also invalid, it, uh, so it's not provable. But these each have weaker constructive variants. So there's a weaker version of the least upper bound property that's constructive and prov constructively provable and a weaker version of intermediate value theorem. And in general, for a lot of classical theorems, you can prove a weaker constructive variant that to some extent captures the essence of what the theorem was trying to get at anyway. But it's just, you know, it's usually just a little harder to use than the original theorem. But with all this in mind, you'll note that I haven't said there's any contradictions. And that's because Bishop's system is actually consistent with classical analysis, unlike Brouwer's system. And unlike other systems in particular that I didn't use, so I didn't use, um, well, first of all, no, it being consistent with classical analysis means that people could use my library for classical analysis if they want to. Um, so that was a good design. I think that was a decent design decision. Um, as for other libraries of reals, other sorry, other kinds of reals, um, there's the Russian constructivist reals uh, where I might be getting this mixed up. I'll just say the computable reals. So if you have real numbers that are based on computable functions, you could use those. But the problem with those is that the real numbers there are uh, countable because there's only countably many Turing machines and thus only countably many computable functions and thus countably many reals, right? Um, what are some other examples? So the homotopy type theory reals, I didn't use those because the version of Agda I'm working in uh, is not built for homotopy type theory. There's another version of Agda called cubical Agda that's meant for homotopy type theory. I didn't learn it, so I just went with this. Okay, so that's that on the real number front. Um, oh, and I guess, I'll, sorry, before I continue, I'll note uh, the homotopy type theory reals also have some um, differences between Bishop's reals in terms of properties. So, I'm not an expert in homotopy type theory, so I might, if any any experts are in the room, they might need to correct me. I don't think they're equivalent to the de to the Dedekind cut construction. Uh, I don't think the hot reals construction is has an equivalent Dedekind con cut construction without countable choice. Um, I think there's a couple of other weird differences, but you know maybe in practice they're not that weird. So that's you know those are the reasons, along with the fact that I'm using standard Agda, I didn't do the hot reals. Okay, so with the real numbers out of the way, I'll just talk now about some uh, some other problems with Agda that are kind of in the background and in the background of proof systems based on programming languages in general. Uh, some problems that I that I face and that others will face to give an idea of what it's like to use a programming language for mathematics. Just check the time. Okay, good. So there's this property of Agda and of these kind of programming languages in general called canonicity where every object can be reduced to a canonical form. So to give you an example, every natural number reduces to zero or successor of n or some other natural. And Agda will automatically compute them, right? So this is a really useful property for proofs by mere computation, like we did before with successor of m equals zero, m plus one. You know, we had successor of zero is one, and then zero plus one automatically computed to one. And for another example, it's like three plus one times four equals two to the four. Imagine having to use axioms or something in order to prove this, you know, you just compute it and Agda automatically computes it. And, you know, you can just say by reflexivity, they're both 16, no problem. But if we didn't, if we weren't able to compute one of the sides to some sort of canonical form, or maybe it didn't have a canonical form computed to something different, you know, how would we actually prove this? You probably need some sort of axioms or maybe a really long proof like imagine if three plus one didn't automatically compute to four, it'd be kind of weird. Imagine if you just swap the order around first to one plus three, it'd be really strange, right? And there are actually examples where this does happen in practical mathematics. So 
let's go ahead and talk about how axioms actually break this canonicity property. So let's just define a piecewise uh, function from the reals to the naturals in this way. It just checks if the given real number is zero or not. Return zero or one correspondingly. Well, equality on R is undecidable. So you can, you know, there's no algorithm to decide for a given real number whether or not it's zero. Uh, so in order to, pr to prove that any given real number is either zero or non-zero, you need to invoke excluded middle. So you need it in order to define this function, but then you're not going to be able to decide which which uh, element x is equal to. Is it equal to zero or is it equal to one? Excluded middle doesn't tell you; it just tells you it's equal to one of them. So you'll get in the case where f of x is not the form zero or one suck of some other natural. It's just when you write it in Agda, even it just goes to f of x, and that's it. It doesn't actually compute to anything. So if you've got any functions like we did before, the proof where suck m equals uh, m plus one, um, Agda will just put suck f of x equals f of x plus one. And you know you can't do a proof like that. You can't compute f of x. So that proof itself is not gonna compute to anything. It won't give us the actual, it won't give us reflexivity and it won't give us the recursive case because it can't tell which one to choose. So if you use excluded middle or axioms in general in this way, uh, when you add in an axiom for to substitute some sort of computation, you break canonicity and you get weird functions of this sort. And this actually comes into play with the, the ring solver as well. So recall like how the ring solver works. It puts it into this normal form and you have to check if the coefficients are equal. Now, the thing is, is if you have undecidable equality for the coefficients, for the real numbers, for example, then the ring solver can't tell how to prove that these are equal. So you need to provide some sort of strong extra proof that they're equal. You can't just say, oh, hey, they, they're the same normal form. Agnes computed them. You know, use decidable equality to prove that it's equal. You can't do that. It's just not going to happen. If you, if you put in excluded middle, the ring solver would be like, yeah, you know, what, it's either equal or it's not, but it can't tell you which one it is. So the ring solver just won't do anything. Now, you might think there's no ring solver then for the real numbers, at least with the reals as the coefficients in your right. Um, but if you just use a ring with decidable equality for the coefficients, like the rational numbers, for example, you know, you can tell whether or not two fractions are equal with no problem, uh, then it doesn't matter. And you can use treat all the other real number terms as um, as uh, just variables in the polynomial, and you can specify to the ring solver how to choose which rationals that have been turned into reals to use as coefficients, which is a really convenient uh, tool that helps in some cases. And then we're going to talk about this is one other thing I noted before we didn't use quotient sets in defining the real numbers. And I said before, and this is the historical reason Bishop has for doing it, is that Bishop thinks there's no need to. Like he just, he defined real numbers perfectly fine without using equivalence classes. But it turns out that in, in programming languages like Agda, it's hard to actually give a description of what a quotient set or quotient type is without axioms and then without breaking canonicity. So for that reason, Agda avoids giving a definition of what quotient types are, at least in standard Agda. Okay, so what does that mean for users of proof assistance, of even other proof assistance, or of Agda with this canonicity problem? Like, how does this, is this only a problem in Agda, or do, how do other proof assistants deal with it, and how do we deal with it? So in the lean proof assistant, which is also a dependently typed language, they don't care. They use classical axioms. They use quotient sets that are axiomatized. They do all this classical mathematics with axioms, and it's still hugely successful. Lean has an absolutely massive standard library. Uh, it's getting a new version soon. It's, you know, people love using the axioms. It's no problem. Uh, their ideology is that, you know, if you ever need to worry about computing something to a canonical form, then you just better make sure that everything that you're using in defining the function you're making, uh, don't use any axioms and that's it. And as someone who has some experience doing some proofs in Lean for a few months on uh, some research, um, this is kind of a blessing and a curse because it's nice that, you know, the, act, the classical axioms are nice. They get to use axiom of choice. 
But there are times where you define some sort of structure that gets wrapped in some sort of API. And then when you try to access that structure using the API, Lean will give you an error that says you can't access this structure because the accessor function is using the axiom of choice to prove that it exists. So I end up getting cases where I just defined something that I was really happy to use. And now Lean says, no, this when you try to use it, we're invoking the axiom of choice. You can't use it. Now, this is kind of frustrating. And you know it can be frustrating to get around this. But the benefit is that you get classical axioms. So it's a trade-off, right? But even still, in my own library, I've had to worry about taking this trade-off to an extent for performance reasons. So consider the case, if you have theorems, you know, usually we don't care about what the proof of the theorem looks like. We usually only care what the statement is. So why waste time computing the proof of the theorem if, we, if you don't care about it? The example I have is the Archimedean property. The Archimedean property in my library takes forever to compute anything. Like it takes forever to give you the natural number it returns. So when you're defining other theorems, you don't want to have to waste all that time. I'm talking literal hours the Archimedean property can take sometimes. The solution then is not to axiomatize the Archimedean property, but instead write the proof out constructively as you would, but don't compute the proof when you're using it in other theorems. There's a special marker you can give a function in Agda to do that so that the theorem behaves like an axiom when you're using it, but it's still you still have a proof for it. This, this breaks canonicity because the proof the theorem behaves as an axiom, but the performance improvement is worth it, right? So like in literal hours, which is insane, but that's how it is. Now in cubicle agda, the homotopy type theory version. Sorry, what, you say agda, again? What, what is it exactly that takes hours? Oh, sorry, uh, computing the Archimedean properties proof. So like the Archimedean property gives you a natural number. Oh, I see. It so can take hours proof. to compute it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, now cubicle agda for homotopy type theory, um, quotient sets and stuff behave differently. And you might be wondering what the univalence axiom, if you know anything about hot, that's the big thing, the univalence axiom. You might think, okay, add the univalence axiom, that's an axiom, so it breaks canonicity. Well, in cubicle agda, the univalence axiom is actually provable, so that's no problem. And they even get to constructively define quotient sets without issue. So, you know, there's no issue there. Um, and that's what it, I don't know much more about cubicle agda, so I can't comment on anything else in that sense. But as far as I know, they don't have a, they don't have a really a problem with canonicity, at least not with these. And what this just tells us is that we're using a programming language. You know, there's performance trade offs and there's design trade offs, and we need to suffer with them because we're using programming languages. So that's all we can really do. So I'll just say what's done now in my library and uh, future things that people could do. So my library for real numbers it implements the arithmetic, uh, all the basic properties like density and whatnot. There's a proof of uncountability that's kind of long, but it works. Um, and then for sequences and series is what I have next is pretty decently complete on that. Convergence and divergence and equivalent criteria. Cauchy completeness is proven. Uh, basic sequence properties along with the standard convergence and divergence tests for series. As for stuff that I would really like done to improve it, um, that I haven't gotten around to personally, um, it would just be nice to have functions to convert from decimals to reals and back. So like write 1.5, instead of having to define a regular sequence, you know, just write 1.5, have some function that converts it. That'd be convenient. There's partially function like that. Like I can write a fraction three over two and convert it to a real. But I, I can't write 1.5. So that's what I want. And then the other big thing is just the ring solver needs to be fixed so that I can just write solve instead of that huge abstract syntax. You know, other ring, other proof systems, you can just write solve and it works perfectly fine. And in standard Agda, I won't comment on cubicle Agda, there's some logic, there's some algebra, and then there's some category theory, which is really interesting, actually. Uh, so you should check out Jacques Carette's uh, Category Theory Library in Agda. And he has talks on that that are uploaded on YouTube um, that are very interesting. It's interesting how category theory changes in Agda. And now I've just got some links and resources here like the library and then a couple of courses to learn Agda. In particular, there's one at the bottom for learning cubicle Agda, 
I didn't do the course myself, but I saw a couple of the lectures and it's uh, really good. But yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it. I'll just leave this up in case anybody's interested in links. Um, so that's the talk. Any questions to Zach? Hey Zach, I wonder if I could ask you a few questions about that slide where you talked about the pros and cons of the bishop style reels. Yep. Okay, here we go. So there's a few there's a few things uh, that that uh, seem seem weird to me here. Um, namely Cauchy completeness and the equivalence to Dedekind cuts. So I was wondering if you could explain. So Cauchy completeness, I guess that comes from the fact that you don't take quotients, right? But you also said that you get um, you get the countable axiom of choice for free. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And then I'll ask another one about the Dedekind cuts. Yeah. So first I'll note the Cauchy completeness isn't exactly about the I guess to some extent, yeah, it is about the lack of quotients. Um, the definition that we gave of Bishop's reals are is equivalent using choice to the Cauchy definition of reals. Um, but the definition of reals that Bishop gave as regular sequences, that property is very important for proving uh, quote, Cauchy completeness in Bishop's system. The particular bounds he gives, one over m plus one over n is useful. Uh, so that's that's the key there. As for the axiom of choice, of countable choice, I'll, I'll go into that. That's a fun one. So let me bring up Agda again. So I'll just wait for this to load. Okay, so this is fun. Um, so axiom of countable choice, its statement is that, you know, if you have a function, sorry, from naturals to the naturals, and you have a proof I'll just go into that, hold on, take a little while to type. That for all, uh, so I guess it shouldn't be a function, it should be a relation. Um, I don't have the syntax right now for relation, actually. I don't remember what part of the library it's in. But anyway, the basic idea is that, I'll write out the, the statement. So axi axiom accountable choices, you know, you have a relation and then for all your natural numbers, uh, if X is related to Y, then you can make a function f from n to n. So, you know, uh, that f of, I think I'm miswriting some Roll things X here. Y. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I think I, mean, I got that uh, mixed around. The first part. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mixed up the order a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a while. But yeah. The basic idea is that when you go to say the initial condition, and then you want to say there's a function. Um, oh, sorry, the first one. Yeah, sorry. That, yeah, 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 I get what you mean. Yeah, and these have to be naturals. Or I guess in the other case, it doesn't need to be. Uh, then you can get your function f from like n to some a, uh, such that for all, what is it? Yeah, I'm not gonna give the exact statement, um, but the basic idea, is that when you give this initial statement here, uh, this is defining a function already by the meaning of existence. So like when you say this, when you say for all, that's defining a function from the natural numbers. And then when you say the existential statement, uh, that's giving you a pair, right? Like we said before of some A and then the proof that it satisfies X related to A. So you've already got this particular A chosen in the meaning of existence. So you can, when you're defining the function, uh, you can define the function just by taking this particular A. So in that way, actually, uh, countable choice is just provable. Well, it's the, it's the type theoretic axiom choice. <laughs> yeah. That is actually, actually mentioned right at the beginning of Bishop's old book, right? He says, the axiom of choice is not actually an issue in constructive mathematics because if you want to choose from something, you already have its existence. He, he mentioned that right on the first pages, right? I think that's all. Yeah. But, but it's not really the axiom of choice. I mean, you know. Right. So does, so the question is, that axiom does it actually give the equivalence between the Cauchy real numbers and the Dedekind numbers? Is that 
Yeah, so yeah, about the dedicated reels, I was wondering if you could talk about that because my under, my understanding is that that uh, requires the lava excluded middle um, for uh, and for these reels, you have to take the quotient and then you need countable choice and the lava excluded middle. That's my understanding. So I was wondering if you could talk about that equivalence between the dedicated cuts and this. Um, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the exact proof anymore. It's been about a year and a half since I learned it. Um, so I'm kind of just basing it now on there's a page in Bishop that says it's true. And I think it has the proof in there as well. Um, so I, I hate to say that, but sorry, <laughs> I don't actually have the proof on me and I can't, uh, it's been too long for me to recall it, uh, the good, the details of it. Sorry, thanks. Let me actually ask what, so I'm not, I don't think we necessarily need them to be equivalent. What would be really useful is to have the map from the Cauchy reel, because they, they are what we will That's probably easy. construct and practice. Like in practice, most real numbers we have are given by sequences. But then we may want to regard them as Dedekind fields. So what would be interesting maybe would just be to have the construction of the Dedekind fields in Akta say, and the comparison map from Cauchy to Dedekind. Sorry? You just say there is a number after which all of these. I know, are I know, but I, I want to, I'm, I'm going after doing it in Akta. So I know. But uh, so I'm wondering what is the prospect of having that in the library? Uh, I haven't done it myself, but I think another proof assistance. I don't know if they did this in Koch. Um, I know Koch initially axiomatized the real numbers and then they, they made instances of the reals. Um, but it works a little bit differently now. They've got actually constructive reals in there. So I haven't done it myself. I think in other proof systems, maybe it exists. Um, but I just haven't done it myself because it wasn't something I was interested in, to be honest. But if, it, if somebody wanted to add it, that'd be fine. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I mean, there's other dedicated construction, cut constructions of the reels in Agda that people have made. Like, um, I'm forgetting who made it now. Sorry. Uh, somebody, but people have made dedicated cut constructions of the reels in Agda before. Uh, they don't have a lot of properties proved about them. So it usually just does the basic construction and that's it. Um, they don't go into sequences and series or anything. So, but yeah, there are dedicated cuts in Agda. And the definition is reasonably short, like it's a pretty decent, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a nice size, like it's not massive or anything. So I think it would be reasonably easy to put them into this library as well. That's interesting. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, we stand Zach again for the very nice talk. Thank you, Thanks for having me. I